having a wonderful Wednesday, and I just want to thank you for setting aside some time tonight to gather around the scriptures, to encourage each other, to hear the Word of God. And we have so much to look forward to coming up this weekend. Saturday, May the 1st, we'll be having Hens and Chicks in the Family Life Center. And then on Sunday, May the 2nd, we will be resuming in-person classes for our children, for our youth, and for the adults. It's going to be a wonderful Sunday. We're going to continue to stream Clint's class on the Gospel of John Sunday morning at 9. And then also, though, here in person, Charles Brazell, my dad, will be teaching the miracles of Jesus in the South Room in person. It's going to be a wonderful time together. Also, that day, we'll set aside to recognize our seniors, and we'll have a meal following services that Sunday morning hosted by Ronnie and Sean Davis. And we need to ask everyone to, to let Ronnie and Sean know if you plan to be there or contact the office, let us know, and we'll communicate that to them so that they can plan appropriately for the meal on that Sunday. Looking forward to seeing you Sunday, May the 2nd. Well, we've been on a journey these past weeks looking at the final week of Jesus' ministry, starting with his triumphal in, entry into Jerusalem on that Sunday and leading up now to the Sunday of his resurrection, Sunday, April 5th, 33 AD. And I want to speak tonight on the topic, what the resurrection of Jesus means. We'll be looking at Matthew 28, verses 1 through 8 is where we'll be. When we saw last, last Wednesday night, Jesus had been placed there in the tomb. That Saturday, guards were placed to guard it. And the word on the street was that Jesus is dead. In fact, the Roman soldiers had no problem going to Pilate and telling him Jesus was dead. I'm sure Pilate asked back, are you sure? And those soldiers absolutely knew Jesus to be dead. The word that the disciples heard and the followers of Jesus was that Jesus is dead. And no doubt it broke their hearts. And the enemies of Jesus, the Pharisees, when they heard of Jesus being dead, certainly they rejoiced. You can see a smile on the, the leaders of the Jews, the Pharisees, on their face as they hear that Jesus is dead. Now they're done with him. Now he's gone and that nuisance is taken away, never to return. He was just another victim of the Roman 
system of capital punishment, just another crucifixion as there were many that took place. Jesus is dead. And the Romans during that time period had several ways of picturing death poetically. One of those ways was the image of a sickle. A sickle was used to, to cut grass or to cut grain. And as that blade of grass would fall to the ground, it was dead. There was no life in it. It was poetically a picture of death. Often burial sites among Roman areas would have engravings, carvings in the wall of someone holding one of those sickles, a picture of death. It was also pictured as a jailer, a jailer who puts someone in jail and locks them in and throws away the key, never to escape, never to come out. Another poetic term of Romans about death was of a crushed flower. A flower, once it's crushed, has lost its beauty, has lost its life. It cannot grow. It cannot come back to bloom. And another picture was that of a broken harp. A harp that at one time was filled with life, music, and joy, but now it's broken. It can no longer play a sound. There's no life. There's no joy. And to the Romans, to the Roman guards, to Pilate, Jesus is dead. He is placed in a tomb. He is never to return. He is guarded. He is sealed. There can be no foul play. There can be absolutely no question of Jesus' death. And there have been many questions through the years about exactly what tomb was Jesus placed in. Where is that tomb? There's multiple sites that have been referenced through the years. But when you think about which tomb is the tomb of Jesus, there's really just two sites that come to the surface Two candidates, primarily. One of them is the Holy Sepulcher, the Church of the Holy Sepulcher, and the other is called the Garden Tomb. Well, if we look at the biblical record about that tomb, we're looking for a tomb that's outside the city, that's near a garden. We're looking for a tomb that's been cut out of stone. We're looking for a rich man's tomb, and we're looking for a tomb that dated to the first century. And most importantly, it's a tomb that's empty. Surprisingly, you find tombs and there's uh, burial sites there. There's bones, there's remnants of people that have been placed there, but not the tomb of Jesus. It's empty. So what about the garden tomb? One of the two candidates for the tomb of Jesus. It was outside the city. It was rock hewn, cut out of stone. But the dating on that tomb, unfortunately, dates to 800 BC, to the Iron Age, when you study that tomb and other tombs that are surrounding that area, the garden tomb, they all are, are old to the Iron Age, 8th century, 800 B.C. So while you can go and visit this tomb, and I have and many of you have, it's a wonderful place for meditation. It's a wonderful place to go and imagine what that morning must have been like on the day of Jesus' resurrection. But it's likely not the tomb. Well, how about the other candidate, the Holy Sepulchre? It was outside the city of Jerusalem in the first century. Now, it's not anymore, but it was then. It was cut out of stone, and it dates to the first century A.D. On top of that, other tombs that are surrounding it and this tomb all model what a first century tomb would have looked like dating to that time period. We, we know this because there are other tombs that are right next to it that are similar to what Jesus would have been laid in, cut out of stone dating to the first century. Now, if you visit this site today, you'll notice that there's multiple layers. Down deep below is where the burial site actually would have been. But through the years, other things have been built on top of it. In fact, it was common for a Roman Romans to build on top. They built a temple on top of this site. Uh, sometimes they would take a sacred site and build their own temple on top of it to, to take the glory away from whatever that sacred site was. But if you go to visit that temple, there at the foundation, you'll notice an inscription that was made by a Christian pilgrim that journeyed there in the third century claiming that site to be the burial site, the tomb of Jesus. It was believed in the first, second, third centuries this is where Jesus was laid. National Geographic did a very thorough research 
at the church, the Holy Sepulchre at this location. Very interesting. And you can see where the burial site was down deep below the church that's, that's built there present time. Down below in this area were both the crucifixion and where the tomb of Jesus would have possibly taken place. You can see here where they laid him in that tomb, that rock-hewn tomb. And years later, Constantine would arrive there at that site, having been inspired by his mother, Queen Helena. They came across this location, and it's, it's then that he built the, the temple and the church that's built on top of that location. Later on, only what remains now of this burial slab is just a lip of what that would have been because a man by the name of Mad Hakim in 1009 AD, he was a Muslim. He wanted to destroy Christianity, so he made it his goal to, to go to any site where Jesus might have been or events might have taken place and to do what he could to destroy those sites. Obviously, he failed to destroy Christianity. He may have destroyed that tomb, but Christianity lives on. Many have asked the question also about how, how long was Jesus in the tomb? We know three days and three nights. We know that he has died about the ninth hour, it says in Scripture. That's three o'clock. That's when he says he breathed his last. And that took place the day before the Sabbath. That evening, that Friday night, 6 o'clock, sundown would have begun the Sabbath. So Jesus is placed in the tomb sometime before sundown on Friday night. And we know that they wanted the bodies to be taken down before the Sabbath. And the Sabbath would have begun at 6 o'clock, sundown, that Friday. So then he rises early on the first day of the week, Sunday. So he's in the tomb about, about 40 hours. But it's just three days and three nights. What's well, important to understand how, the, how Jews reckoned time in the first century. A day began at sundown, just like it says at the creation, there was evening and there was morning the first day. A day began sundown, and one day was sundown to sundown. So Jesus is in the tomb Friday before sundown, that's day one. He remains in the tomb Saturday sundown to sundown, that's day two, and then he rises early on the first day of the week, Sunday, that's day three. Three days and three nights, that's based upon the reckoning of time. Listen to how Matthew describes this beautiful morning early. Matthew 28, beginning at verse one, after the Sabbath, at dawn on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. There was a violent earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven, going to the tomb, rolled back the stone, and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning, and his clothes were as white as snow. The guards were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead men. The angel said to the women, Do not be afraid. For I know that you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He is not here. He has risen, just as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples, He has risen from the dead and is going ahead of you. So the women hurried away from the tomb, afraid yet filled with joy. And they ran to tell the disciples. Rumbling that morning, a stirring, an earthquake, at daybreak on that Sunday morning, the first day of the week, oh, the Romans had reported that Jesus was dead. The guards went to Pilate and said he's dead. The Pharisees rejoiced because he is dead. No doubt Satan rejoiced, thinking that he indeed would now ascend and take the glory of God. But that angel reported on that Lord's Day morning, see where they've laid him. He is not here. He is risen. He is alive, just as he said, when the women went to the tomb, they found the stone rolled away. The very stone that Joseph had rolled into place. The very stone that guards watched eagerly with their eyes. The very stone that they put a seal next to, to ensure that it never opened. The stone couldn't hold the resurrection power, the resurrected Lord back. 
And the angel announced that he is alive. Jesus appearing to John on the island of Patmos in Revelation 1 and verse 18 declares, I am the living one. I was dead. And now look, I am alive forever and ever. And I hold the keys of death and of Hades. So what does the resurrection of Jesus mean? We gather together each Lord's Day. We do the Lord's table, the Lord's supper, the break the bread, the drink the cup, taking the cup. We do this in remembrance of him, remembering his death, his burial, but also remembering his resurrection, remembering that he now lives. What does the resurrection mean? Well, it means, first of all, that since Jesus has raised from the dead, it means that Jesus is the Messiah. He is the promised one. The word Messiah means anointed, and it's the same word as Christ. Jesus Christ, Jesus the Messiah, Jesus the anointed one. He is the one who was promised all through the pages of Scripture. And you cannot open a page of Scripture, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, all the way to Malachi, without finding prophecy pointing to the, to the ministry, the life, the birth, the death, the resurrection of Jesus. It's all about him, the story of redemption. Notice what Jesus said about himself in John 10. The reason my father loves me is that I lay down my life only to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down on my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and authority to take it up again. This command I received from my father. Yes, Jesus is the Messiah. He is exactly who he said he was, and he is exactly who he says he is. He is the promised one. And so the resurrection proves beyond a shadow of doubt that he is the one who was to come, the one who lived, the one who died, the one who was resurrected. And since, since he's exactly who he said he is, and he says he is, that tells us that he also will do exactly what he says he will do. And we live in a world that's filled with lies. We live in a world that's filled with fake news. We feel, live in a world that's filled with false hope and false answers and solutions to problems according to the world's way. And we see across this land and around this world problems like most of us have never seen before. When we come to the resurrected Lord, we recognize that he alone is the solution to these problems. We, we don't need more money. We don't need more economy and more of the world's solutions. We need what Jesus has to offer, and only he can offer. He is the solution. It is for this reason that we dedicate much of our time here in our Bible classes, in what we preach and what we teach, because we want you, we want the world, we want to be exposed to Jesus. We want to know him, not only in our minds, but in our actions, in our beings, in our attitudes. We want this knowledge of Jesus to transform us. We, yes, we're saved, but it should transform our everyday lives. Every day that goes by, we should live a little more like him, be a little more like him, look more like him. And so it is our goal, it's our purpose to, to analyze and study the life of Christ in the pages of Scripture, and not just study it, but then to live it out. If we were to take the Old Testament and look at all of the prophecies pointing to Jesus as the Messiah, the promised one, there are over 300 prophecies, 300 prophecies plus pointing to Jesus as the Messiah. If you were to just take eight of those prophecies, the eight prophecies like the fact that about his birth, about the fact that he'd be born in Bethlehem, that he'd be born of a virgin, that he'd be betrayed for 30 pieces of silver, that he would be mocked, that he would be crucified, pierced, that he would be buried with the rich. If you were to take just eight of those prophecies, the chances 
of one person fulfilling just eight of those prophecies just by mere sheer chance. The chances of one person fulfilling those down to the T, specifically down to, to the wire, every detail, the chance of, is one in, in 10 to the 17th power. That is a one with 17 zeros after it. It would be the equivalent of covering the state of Texas with silver dollars two feet deep and taking one silver dollar and marking it red and just putting it out there somewhere and taking some one person blindfolded and that person on their first try selects that one marked silver coin. That's just if we take eight of the prophecies but there's more than 300 of them. And Jesus fulfilled every single one. Not partially, not kind of, not in a way. He fulfilled them down to even his bones not being broken on the cross. Even to Isaiah using the word that he was pierced for our transgressions. Pierced. You see, Jesus is the Messiah. And the resurrection of Jesus proves to us, proves to the world that he is the promised one. What does the resurrection mean? Well, it also means that our resurrection will take place. In Jesus dying, our sins are forgiven as his blood is shed on the cross. Behold, the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. In Jesus' burial in the tomb, our sins are buried with him to remain there. In Jesus' resurrection, he's raised to a new body, to a new life. And so, not only as we are baptized into that death, burial, and resurrection, we're raised to walk a new life, we are also assured that there is eternity after death. There is life after the grave. Our resurrection is certain to take place. It will take place. Jesus' resurrection himself is proof of that. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 12, but if it is preached that Christ has been, cruci has, has, if it is preached that Christ has been raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? It was a question that they were asking. If there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless, and so is your faith. And Paul goes on to say, but Christ has been raised to the dead, raised from the dead, the first fruits of the resurrection. He's the firstborn from the dead, assuring that we too the dead in Christ will be raised. So the resurrection of Jesus gives us this assurance that all who die in Christ will be raised to live with him forever. This is exactly why Jesus appeared to his disciples after his resurrection. He t the angel tells the ladies there at the tomb to go and tell his disciples, and then he himself appears to them to show them his resurrected body. These disciples then go out exposed to torture, persecution, facing death, because they knew that there was resurrection, life after death. They could face anything. It, it, it strengthened Paul to allow himself to be executed, knowing that there would be a resurrection to follow. I've been asked before, how do you know that Christians who die go to heaven? And the answer to that is we know because Jesus is raised from the dead. And that, that assures us that we will too. You see, we have a home that's promised for us and to us in eternity. A boy once went to the store with his mother, and there on the counter was a jar filled with candy. The clerk behind the counter told the boy, Go ahead, put your hand in there, grab a handful. But unlike this boy, who's normally loud and talkative, he just stood there silent. Well, the man, the clerk, finally put his own hand inside and grabbed the candy out and put it in the boy's hand. When they went outside, the mother asked the boy, why did you go shy all of a sudden? Why didn't you just take the candy, put your hand in there and take it? Like the clerk asked. And the boy said, because his hand is bigger than mine. Smart boy. He knew he'd get more candy because that man's hand was bigger than his. Do you know that God's hand is bigger than ours? 
His power is greater than I, ours. I don't have the ability to resurrect anyone. We're humans. Like grass today, gone tomorrow. Like a mist that blows in the wind. That's a vapor that, that goes away. But God's hand is bigger than ours, more powerful than ours. And the same resurrection power that raised Jesus from the dead is assured to raise you and me and all who are baptized into Christ. So what does the resurrection mean? Well, it means Jesus is exactly who he says he is. He's the Messiah. But it means that our resurrection will most certainly take place. There will be a day when the shout of the archangel will take place and every eye will see him and the dead in Christ will raise first. What a day that will be. I think third of all, the resurrection of Jesus provides also for our future inheritance. Peter said in 1 Peter 1, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you. What a beautiful promise given to us here. The resurrection of Jesus grants us, provides for us an inheritance. Not an inheritance that thieves can steal, that moths can eat away with, that rusts, but an inheritance that can never perish, that can never spoil, that can never fade, that's kept in heaven for you and for me. And the resurrection of Jesus provides that assures that, maintains it, and that same power that raised Jesus up, that raises us up, also may, ensures that there is an inheritance for you. You see, Jesus told his disciples, I go to prepare a place for you so that where I am, you can be also. The King James Version used that word, many mansions. What a Wonderful sight. The NIV translates that a place, a gathering, a, a home. A home for you and a home for me. Most people in America move, on average, I've read studies about seven times in their lifetime. I actually know someone that has moved 20 times in 56 years. And any time you move, it always takes time to get acclimated to a new place, to a new home, to a new town, to new friends, to new neighbors, to new streets. But when we go home to heaven, when we go to the place that's been prepared for you and for me, we will never be, we will never be more at home than ever before. You see, that is our home. In fact, Paul would say that our citizenship is in heaven. The moment we arrive, we will recognize that it is a place that's been prepared for you, a place prepared for me. A little girl spoke of the Savior in the hearing of several people, and the Savior whom she loved. And a man who was listening to her said to her, little girl, don't you know? You have no idea. You don't even know what you're talking about. There have been many through the years who have claimed to be Savior. And she answered, I said, well, all I know is that the one that I believe in, the Savior that I believe in, is the one who rose from the dead. There's many throughout the ages that have claimed to be a Savior of one sort or another. The only one that leaves an empty tomb, his name is Jesus. He is the answer to every problem that we face in this day and time. Finally, the resurrection of Jesus powers our walk with God. We serve a risen Savior. It, it, it's not that we're just living for Jesus. It's the fact that he is also living in us. Without him, we can do nothing. But with him, all things are possible. Paul describes it like this in Galatians 2. I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. And the life I now live in the body, 
I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. There's not a single one of us that's asked to live this Christian life in our own power. To do so would be futile. We are told to live the Christian life in the power of Jesus. As he dwells in us, lives in us, that resurrection power that raised him up is able to empower us to walk with God, to walk faithfully, to have a greater commitment to him, to be committed to the saints of God, meeting together, worshiping on the Lord's Day. It empowers us to be more like Jesus, to look more like him, to live more like him. That's why Paul would say we can literally do all things through him, through Christ, who, who gives us the strength to do that. The reality is, is that many of us as Christians, we've forgotten that he dwells inside of us, that to empower us, that he gives us the power to live the life that he wants us to. Often we get ourselves caught up in trying to do it in our own strength. We forget the power that dwells within us through Christ Jesus. William Randolph Hearst was, was known to be obsessed with art. Even as a child, his mother would say that he would co constantly look for and collected various artifacts. One time, William Randolph Hearst was reading about an extremely valuable piece of art. He decided that he must have that for his collection. He told one of his agents to go to search every art house around the world, every museum, every collector, every collection, and to find that piece of art of great value and to pay the necessary price to retrieve it. He wanted that to be part of his museum collection, his art collection. The agent went all over the world looking in warehouses, looking in art museums, looking up among collections and collectors. Finally, after months and months of meticulous searching, the art object was found. Guess where it was found? William Randolph Hearst already owned it. It was found in one of his own warehouses stored away. He owned this most valuable piece of art and he'd forgotten that he even purchased it. He'd forgotten that he even owned it. And as Christians, it's easy for us to forget just what the resurrection of Jesus means. It means that Jesus is who he says he is beyond a shadow of a doubt. That we should be able to face any circumstance in life, no matter what it is, knowing that our Messiah is exactly who he says he is. The resurrection of Jesus also guarantees our own resurrection, that we will live forever. It also provides for us that inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. And the resurrection power dwells in us, enabling us to live the life that he asks us to live. Let's not make the mistake of forgetting the power of his resurrection. You see, for us, it doesn't end with a tomb. No, it all begins with an empty tomb. And there is not a historian, there's not an archaeologist, there's no one on the face of this planet that's ever lived, that ever will live, that can point you to a tomb that holds the body of Jesus. The only thing that anybody can point to is an empty tomb because he lives. That's what the resurrection means for you and for me. And let's pray. Father, we do thank you for your son who died, who was buried, but was also resurrected. And thank you for what that resurrection means. There is no fear of death. Thank you, Father, that it means that we can trust Jesus fully and completely, knowing his, he is who he says he is, the Messiah. Thank you, Father, that it guarantees our own resurrection, that we'll live forever with you. And the, that it also provides the inheritance that you promise us in eternity, a place for us that we can be with you. And Father, 
Thank you for not abandoning us here in this life, but giving us what we need through the power of Jesus in our lives to live like him, to talk like him, to teach like him, and to walk with him. Thank you, Father, for the resurrection of your son and that because of that, we too can live a new life. It's in the name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. Still have peace. I still have.